So we're still in our series uh, where we're talking about the Lord's Prayer. And uh, today, obviously, we're talking about forgiveness. And I want to share with you a scripture this morning that comes to us from Ephesians chapter 4. So I'm going to share this with you. It's uh, Ephesians 4, 21 through 32. If you'd like to follow along, maybe you have a Bible uh, handy at home. Since you really listened to him and you were taught how the truth is in Jesus, change the former way of life that was part of the person you once were, corrupted by deceitful desires. Instead, renew the thinking in your mind by the spirit and clothe yourself with the new person created according to God's image in justice and true holiness. Therefore, after you have gotten rid of lying, each of you must tell the truth to your neighbor because we are parts of each other in the same body. Be angry without sinning. Don't let the sun set on your anger. Don't provide an opportunity for the devil. Thieves should no longer steal. Instead, they should go to work, using their hands to do good so that they will have something to share with whoever is in need. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Only say what is helpful when it is needed for building up the community so that it benefits those who hear what you say. Don't make the Holy Spirit of God unhappy. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. Put aside all bitterness, losing your temper, anger, shouting, and slander, along with every other evil. Be kind, compassionate, and forgiving to each other in the same way God forgave you in Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we begin, let's take a moment. Let's pray together. God, we thank you today for the gift of the scripture. We thank you for your work in our lives. And we pray that as we think together about um, what it means to forgive and be forgiven, Lord, that you'd be at work so that we might understand your word more deeply. The, we might understand your work in our lives more fully we might be transformed into those people that you're calling us to be for the sake of your love and your mission in the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know, the problem with forgiveness is that it's a gift everyone wants. No, actually, everyone needs to receive. And yet it's something that almost all of us struggle to give away. When we're hurting, there's a piece of us that feels like we're gaining power by refusing to forgive. And that's understandable, but it leads to a problem. What ends up happening is that in the world economy of forgiveness, the giving and receiving are not in balance. So the demand for forgiveness far exceeds the supply. So why is this a problem? Well, when you think about it, what might you call the imbalance between the forgiveness we need and the forgiveness that we actually receive? Well, one word for it might be guilt. Think about how much guilt there is that's free floating in the world, how much each one of us carries around with us all the time. It's heavy, it's awkward. It's hard to walk around with guilt on our shoulders. And it's incredibly damaging to our spirits and corrosive to our relationships. It causes us to wildly misjudge one another because we see other people's action through the lens of our own guilt and shame. And then we misinterpret and we misjudge their intentions. And as long as we're stuck in that place, we really can't be free. and We really can't be happy. The basic concept of forgiveness that's embedded in the Lord's Prayer is that it acknowledges this need for there to be balance between the forgiveness we seek and the forgiveness that we share with others. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So there's this balance. Now, different people pray this prayer differently. So Catholics, Episcopalians, and Methodists, we say trespasses. If you're with Presbyterians, they'll say debts. Others will say sins. The word debts actually is the most accurate translation of what Jesus says, and it's consistent with how Jesus talks about sin in other places in the Gospels. He uses the concept of debt to talk about sin very frequently. The differences between the words different denominations use actually arise from which early translation of the Bible they 
uh, used to build their liturgy. So one of the first to translate the Bible to English, a guy named William Tyndale, he translated the word as trespasses, which made its way into the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. So that's why we say it that way, because we as Methodists are descended from the Anglicans. Now, as an aside, just for general interest, Tyndale was actually executed for having the audacity to translate the Bible into English. But ironically, people saved his work. So that's kind of a funny thing, right? This is so dangerous that this guy needs to die. Yet we better hold on to his stuff because I think that it might be important later. So in a few years, actually, his work became the basis for several official and authorized translations. But let's come back to the content of the prayer itself. When we say, forgive us as we forgive, I believe that there's an important statement that God is making here about guilt and specifically about our need to live free from guilt. God doesn't want us to live with it. God definitely doesn't want us behaving in ways that add to the burden of guilt. It's already present in the world. There's plenty of that to go around as it is. And so to me, some of the most important words and powerful words in the whole of scripture are what Jesus says from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. To me, this says everything that I need to know about the lengths to which God is willing to go to relieve us of our guilt and how much it actually matters. All of us regret certain things that we've said or done or have relationships where we carry guilt over the ways that we've allowed little hurts to accumulate or distance to grow between us. But let's admit the obvious. It's the nature of human beings to hurt each other. We don't mean to. It's just that frequently we are not at our best. I mean, think about it, being tired, being hungry, being stressed, every little thing affects us. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have been at your best this week? Now listen, I can't see you, but if any single one of you put your hand up, I guarantee that you are lying right now. Have any of you seen that meme that says, if I'm talking to myself, don't mind me, I'm just having a parent-teacher conference? I think that is very real for a lot of parents, especially parents of young children this week. And the longer we have to live in close quarters with our families, we're going to experience more and more moments like that. So it's going to take some serious understanding and patience over this next little bit of time. It's going to take a whole lot of understanding and a whole lot of forgiveness. Which brings me back to today's scripture. There are several New Testament passages like this that we might call maybe exhortations or admonitions about how to live a holy life. They make a distinction between an old way of living before you knew Jesus and a new way of living after you've met Jesus. They invite us to renew our way of thinking about ourselves, about the world, about what's important. I saw an interview the other day in the paper with a cloistered nun from Summit, New Jersey, who was offering her thoughts to those uh, who are not familiar with what it means to be shut up at home. Now, she understands this very well. The sisters in her order never leave their convent except for medical appointments. And she had three pieces of advice that she shared. First, she said, you need structure in your days. If no one is imposing that structure on you by saying, okay, you've got to be at work at this time or you've got to catch the bus or whatever it is, then you have to choose a structure that's going to work for you and for your family. Everyone needs a rhythm in order to feel productive. Second, Be intentional about loving the people in your life right now. So that means check in on your neighbors. Spend time playing a board game with your family. Get out in the woods with the people you love for a hike. You have some time now. So don't be afraid to share that time with each other. The third thing she said was to use this lull for reading and reflection and prayer and rest. Don't be afraid to build an afternoon nap into your routine. But one thing that struck me in what she said was that in order to live in a small community like this, now she's only one of 18 sisters who who live in this convent together. She said, you have to learn to listen, to forgive, and accept each other. The letter to the Ephesians puts it in the same way. Don't let any foul words come out of your mouth. Specifically, what that word foul means is rotten. Don't speak words that will rot away your relationships. Only say what is helpful for building up your connections with people. Put aside bitterness, put aside anger, and instead seek kindness 
and compassion and forgiveness. Remember that you are not who you once were before you met Jesus. And now he's calling you to live like meeting him has made a difference for you. So when we pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It sounds a bit like a quid pro quo, like we're only asking God to forgive us to the extent that we've forgiven others. Now, it may be helpful for you to think of it that way if you need a little bit of motivation to push you in that right direction. But here's the reality. The reality is that God has already made the choice to forgive, and it has nothing to do with how we respond to that forgiveness. Remember those words from the cross, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. The decision to forgive has already been made. There's no question about it. It is done. Nothing that we do or don't do can ever diminish that. But when we decide not to forgive, it certainly diminishes us. It diminishes our relationships and it takes away something that we all desperately need. We desperately need to be forgiven. And what instead it allows to fill in that space is guilt. Now, a little bit of guilt can be good because it can help to motivate change in us. But if at some point that guilt is not released and let go, which can only happen when we're offered and accept forgiveness, then that guilt becomes toxic for us. The best thing that God has to offer us is an unconditional love that says, no matter what, you are forgiven. You are forgiven and you are beloved. You still matter no matter what you've done. This is freedom. All that flows directly from the cross of Jesus. And so when we pray, forgive us as we forgive, we can also talk about it as a challenge a challenge to grow in our forgiveness of others, to learn how to forgive as God has forgiven us, to not allow guilt to grow in the world, but instead to wash it away, replacing it with freedom and lightness and love. And so let this be your challenge this week, to learn how to forgive as God has forgiven you. Let's take a moment to pray together. God, we thank you for all the gifts that you've given us, and most especially today for that gift of forgiveness that you so freely offer to us. We pray that as we embrace that forgiveness, that we might learn to shower it upon others so that just as we learn more and more to live without guilt, as we learn more and more to live as free people, that you might also enable those around us to know that same freedom and that same love that comes from knowing you and loving you and being loved by you. We are grateful for all that you've done for us, and we give you thanks in all things through your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.